Hi, my name is Wes Anderson, Vice President of Agronomy for Croptimistic Technology, a global egg tech company. Today, I'm here to talk to you about SWAT maps and the SWAT ecosystem of products and how they can be used to deliver high resolution precision agronomy on the farm. First of all, I have to introduce SWAT maps or soil, water and topography maps. SWAT maps are very high resolution soil foundation maps or what we often refer to as soil potential maps, usually used to execute variable rate fertilizer, seed, soil amendments like lime, soil applied herbicides, and occasionally even irrigation water. They are a patented process which is designed to use multiple layers of spatial soil and water and topography data to all go into a single soil management zone map. Now they include soil, water and topography. And, and the idea here is that they can include all the factors that go to produce that spatial soil and water related variability across a field. Soil includes things like soil texture, which is obviously very important, organic matter, topsoil depth, and in some areas, saline soils, which have a profound impact on yield and fertilizer responses. Water, of course, we all know is the biggest impact on yield. And the one thing that is common between all SWAT maps is a delineation between wet and dry areas of the field, which I'll expand on more in a moment. Topography, topography, of course, just describes the landscape position, so typically knoll, mid-slope, depression, roughly speaking, and of course influences water flow and accumulation across the landscape, and along with that nutrient levels, pH, and things like topsoil depth and erosion. So one of the most common uses for SWAT maps is to better understand plant available nutrients so that we know how many more nutrients to add to reach our given yield potential, which is largely driven by plant available water. And that's what drives the return investment on those available nutrients is the actual yield increase from what we've applied. But the broader point here is that the, the starting point for, for all these uh, factors that, that drive plant available nutrients starts with two key things, parent material and its texture and salt characteristics that we can measure with an EM sensor, like in the swap box, and topography and elevation. And those two key things can have varying influence depending on what field we're in. And that's why every swap map is unique to each field. Swap maps always have 10 zones. We want a swap map to be not just good today, but in 10 years time when application technology continues to develop to be able to apply inputs more and more accurately by section and even by row. The consistent approach of 10 zones and common coloring between zones also minimizes confusion when you're comparing swap maps on different fields or different farms. The one thing that's fairly common or across all SWAT maps, no matter where you are in the world, is this common delineation from dry to wet. So zone one is generally going to be your driest part of the field, either due to texture or landscape position, or often both. And zone 10 is often going to be the wettest part of the field. Again, often it's a depression. Uh, if you're in an area with salinity or peat or sodic subsoils, these soil types would often get delineated into zone 10. But there is this common trend from dry to wet as you go from upper landscape to lower landscape positions or sandier texture to more clay texture and that sort of thing. With that, we often see this delineation of topsoil depth. Zone one often has shallower, less developed topsoils, perhaps eroded. As we go down through to zone five and zone 10, we see increasing depth of topsoil this happens to be two foot soil profiles that we see here. And it's not uncommon to see increasing in percent organic matter as well as we go from zone one to 10. But that being said, every field is unique. One way we can think about this is we're trying to delineate different parts of the field into both fertilized response probability, how likely it is that they'll respond to added nutrients and yield potential because we need to understand both those things to make an ideal recommendation. 
in respect to nutrients at least anyway. So for a long time we've had tools to uh, you know make maps of yield potential or what the actual yield was using either NDVI imagery for certain crops in season or uh, yield maps at the end of the day that have been cleaned and processed. But we know from experience that low yielding parts of the field can be low yielding for very different reasons, for example, and the response within those regions can vary a lot. We can have low yield potential areas because they're actually short of nutrients. They need more nutrients. In other words, their response probability is very, very high. We also have low yielding areas because of problems that are not nutrient related and won't respond to additional nutrients. Maybe it's saline areas, for example, that are just simply salt limited. So within each of those categories, you can have a lot of variation in return and investment of added nutrients from fertilizer or manure or compost. The same goes for within even some of the highest yielding areas. You can have high yielding parts of a field that are not actually very responsive, at least not to certain nutrients. And the soil can supply nutrients at very, very high rates to support those yields often for quite a long time. So this graphic is specific to each and every nutrient and every field, but an example for phosphate, for instance, might be this, where we have an eroded hill, zone one, uh, on the swap map that has relatively low yield potential because it's just an eroded knoll that's often somewhat water limited, um, has lost topsoil, but it might actually respond really well to phosphorus or even zinc or sulfur because of the lack of topsoil and lack of some of those nutrients that are there to support the yield potential. We can move somewhat downslope to maybe a zone four that often has fairly high yield potential and often high fertilizer response because it's an area that has always grown high yields and has never had uh, you know, enough phosphorus applied to keep up with the removal of phosphate in those harvested yields. Sometimes we see really deep fertile depressions in a zone seven or eight that have a lot of very productive soil and high yield potential, lots of water availability. Often they're actually fairly high in phosphorus because of all the, all the phosphate uh, that's taken there and dissolved in water or even in, in topsoil that's been eroded to those parts of the landscape. And as a result, they're not necessarily very responsive to phosphorus even though they're high yielding. Maybe we also have a, a saline area or perhaps some sodic soil with some subsoil constraints that are limiting yield potential. Those areas of the field often have a lot of nutrients in the soil because of years and years of over application. And as a result, they're always gonna have relatively poor response to added phosphate. So that's just an example. But as I said, this will vary by nutrient and by field. We want to understand what is the limiting factor and in a way, we want the limiting factor to actually be water. Because we can't really control water, at least not in dry land systems, but we can control nutrition and soil nutrition, and we can adjust it to meet our needs to maximize yield potential. Here's an example of a field where we have a zone one and actually a zone nine and 10 that would all yield quite similarly, but for very, very different reasons. And this is the power of swap maps. Those zones might look similarly from a satellite or on a yield map, but at the end of the day, it's important to understand why they're low yielding. Zone one, we have a sandier textured soil that's low in organic matter and nutrient supplying power. It's actually quite acidic and could benefit from some lime. There's some, some nutrients here, O-line in blue, that are, that are you know, a concern as they're reading lo fairly low levels in the soil test. In the mid zones, four, five, six, there's not too many issues. And these areas have traditionally been the highest yielding parts of this field. And it's not hard to see why. As we get into some lower zones here, seven through 10, we see increasing salt actually becoming saline and saline sodic in zone 10 with high sodium levels. And again, that becomes the, the yield limiting factor is really just salt and sodicity in zones nine and 10. It's not nutrient limited. And as a result, this is an area of the field where we can start to pull back and applied nutrients and save some money 
without limiting yield any further. There are several key steps to the swap maps process. And the first step, of course, is collecting the data. We start with collecting electrical conductivity data, typically from our proprietary soil mapping device, the swap box. At the same time, we also collect elevation data, high, high resolution, high accuracy, RTK elevation, or sometimes from LIDAR, depending on what area we're in. And that elevation data goes into some water modeling and produces a lot of different water related layers that can all be included in the swap map. We also produce a topography model. So again, this topography map is very different than the elevation map. Topography tells us ultimately the areas of the field that are water shedding or water collecting. In some areas, or sometimes, we can collect a soil color image from satellite imagery typically, and also maybe include that in the final swap map. But the point is, is that any number of these layers can go in to produce the final swap map depending on the factors that affect variability in that particular field. What layers go in to produce the final SWAT map is chosen by a SWAT certified agronomist, so a person that's trained in understanding all the data layers that can go together in some combination to produce that map. They'll come to the field and drive around looking for visual cues such as differences in stubble color or density, differences in soil texture, a better understanding how water flows or accumulates across the landscape, even potentially looking at soil depth and, and texture variation as we go from surface to subsoil. And it's all these factors that help us understand what layers and go together into the final map and how they go together to produce the map. The next step is soil sampling, which can be done in the same trip as when it's ground truthed. And all the soil test points can be created through the SWAT records app when the agronomist is actually in the field. And those points are used year after year to go back to the exact same locations to take those soil cores to monitor year-over-year -year changes in soil properties such as nutrient levels or pH or even salt. So again, typically the goal is variable rate fertilizer and often seed, such as in this example where we have a variable rate canola seed layer and then three different fertilizer products. But this obviously is dependent on every farm and cropping system and what the capabilities are and what justifies a variable rate application or not. These prescriptions can all be written in SWOT records, our software system, and everything is stored in that system for use later. This prescription would be written to a file that is then loaded on the controller in the tractor or seeding equipment. Typically, the next step will involve some in-season assessments in crop where we may look at things like some plant populations. Okay, if we're going to do variable rate seed, we understand that you know we need to do some measuring and know that we're doing the right thing so that we can adjust the program for the future for best success. We often see some quite significant mortality rate differences throughout SWAT zones. So in this example we have wheat where we're counting in plants per square foot and we can see that the high mortality in zone 10 which is very common there's we can see there's heavy weed pressure there probably waterlogged part of the field uh, we may want to actually apply more seed there in the future to give better crop competition or use more plant available water, for example. A newer option now available to fully SWAT mapped farms is the SWAT cam, a fully autonomous crop imaging device that's typically mounted to sprayer booms. These cameras take pictures of the crop and weeds that are there when the sprayer makes the pass over the field. And the data is automatically sent to the SWAT record server for processing through some machine learning algorithms that detect the difference between crop and weeds and can even do some plant counts in certain crops like corn and soybeans and canola and there will be more being added to that list. There's analytics automatically calculated by SWAT zone to give us trends by zone for future management changes needed such as variable rate seeding rates, or perhaps even targeted herbicide applications to target particularly weedy areas. 
All the SWATCAM data is stored in the SWAT record server and can be accessed through the desktop software like we see here or through the mobile app when you're in the field. You can even bring up individual images and overlay any of the machine learning algorithm masks available to that particular crop or situation. So there's a lot of data available there and it's very high resolution, usually with hundreds if not thousands of images on every field. In 2024, we're excited to launch our yield potential program, which will be available to fully swap mapped farms. This program will bring a whole new level of analytics, taking properly cleaned yield data and relating it back to the SWAT maps and all the data we have that's associated within the SWAT ecosystem. This allows us to make better decisions about input use and land use in the future. Also launching this year is our first step in client sustainability reporting, starting with a 4R nutrient stewardship report, a simple but effective report that details the level of 4R nutrient stewardship used on every single field and summarized by crop and by farm. This report will be able to be signed off by a 4R certified agronomist and provided to end users as needed. And that brings us near the end. So we've talked today about the SWOT ecosystem, mainly focusing on the starting point, which is soil potential part of the program where we collect good quality data, get it ground truth, get good quality soil samples, and start with really understanding the soil and water characteristics that affect field variability year in and year out. We also dove into the yield potential part of our program, which includes things like SWAT cam and yield analytics through the yield potential program reporting. All this entire SWAT ecosystem though, is supported by our SWAT support portal and support team behind the scenes and our training through SWAT Academy for all new partners. And of course it's all supported by our whole SWAT record software system where data is available through the desktop and app when you're in the field by both farmers and agricultural consultants. So in summary, a SWAT map is what we like to call a soil potential map based on the stable soil and water properties that reflect the spatial variability across a landscape every single year. SWAT maps are the starting point to use the whole SWAT ecosystem of precision ag tools including things like SWAT water and SWAT cam that I mentioned earlier. A SWAT map is not a yield or NDVI based zone map. We're, we're very used to looking at those maps and they're valuable for certain things. There is normally a relationship to yield, but it's not necessarily linear. Yield is a product of spatial and temporal variability. So it varies year to year with in season rainfall or even crop type. A SWAT map is not just another EM or EC map either. There's companies that offer that service, but SWAT maps take that type of data to the next level and bring in other factors like topography and water related factors to make a much more accurate, much more high resolution map that'll be good for many, many years in the future. It encompasses all the factors that drive soil and water variability every year, not just what EM data can measure. So finally, I sincerely thank you for watching this video and I hope that I was able to answer your questions about SWAT maps and the SWAT ecosystem of products. If you're looking for additional information or want to reach out to us, please go to swatmaps.com where you can find a map of all the different SWAT service providers around the world or inquire through email directly to the Croptimistic SWAT Maps team.